Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello students, welcome to Swayam Prabha channel. I am Swati Solanki, working as Assistant Professor at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. I am taking up the course titled as White Collar Crime and in today's session, we are going to understand the Differential Association Theory and Fraud Triangle Theory. Before we Go on to understand this. Let's first look at the objectives of the session. First, to understand how the criminal behavior is learned. Second, what are the justifications for trust violators to abuse the position of trust? Before we proceed on to this, in the last session we talked about that earlier criminal theories were focusing on the aspects that criminality is to be associated either with the physical attributes of a person or with the social conditions that they were living in. Today, it's going to be a continuation of the previous lecture. Now, if you look at the theory, it was first developed by Edwin H. Sutherland in the early to mid 20th century to explain how does one learn criminal behavior. He believed that the adequate explanation of criminal behavior can be reached only by locating the abstract mechanism and processes which are common to both the rich and the poor, the emotionally stable and the emotionally unstable who commit crimes. If I were to simplify this, it means that in order to understand how does one become the criminal, it is important to first trace that what are the processes that this individual has undergone. Different individuals may have different life experiences and they may have different responses to these life experiences. Sutherland had referred to a motion picture wherein two boys were at the site of the criminal offense of theft. One boy was born with the long stature and the other one was had a, the other one had a short stature. The one with the long legs was able to escape the site of the offence and the one with the shorter legs, because he could not run away or escape the site, he was apprehended by the investigating agencies. He was then admitted to the correctional facility wherein he came into the contact with the other gangsters. When he was released from this correctional facility, he too became a gangster in the next phase of his life. Now let's go back to this example and think about the one person who was having the longer legs. He escaped this experience that has occurred in his life. He then decided that he would become a priest. Now when we try to understand what exactly happened here, the earlier social scientists believed that, that these physical attributes can be associated with the criminal behavior. However, Sutherland refutes this correlation that criminality has nothing to do with one having longer legs and the other one having the shorter legs. He then says that it is about what are the life experiences of these individuals. Now, when we look further, he suggests 
that criminal behavior is a result of a process of socialization during which the criminal definitions or we can say the criminal attitudes are not only transmitted culturally but are actually learned through interaction within intimate groups or we can say in interpersonal communication. Now when we think about this differential association theory, Sutherland has outlined nine key principles and we are going to take those nine principles one by one. The first one is and he suggests criminal behavior is learned, it is neither invented nor inherited. Now what he is trying to say as Lombroso suggested that one person is a born criminal wherein we discuss that people inherit genetical disposition wherein at some point of that life they are going to exhibit criminal behavior. So Sutherland is trying to refute that belief or proposition here and he argues that it is not inherited, it is not invented also. Now what does that mean? So when he says that criminal behavior is learned, negatively he is trying to imply that the skills and the techniques that are required to commit a criminal offense, they are not the innovations that people are making. Further, they are not learned just because they have associated with other criminals. He says that just like a person or a child learns how to tie his shoelaces, likewise an individual also learns how to commit the shop lifting. So we say that this criminal behavior is not something that he was born with, rather he has learned this behavior looking at the things that were surrounding to him. And now these things are being discussed in the next proposition. Sutherland further says in his second proposition that, that when we talk about this criminal behavior, this criminal behavior is learned in interaction with other person in the process of communication. Now when we think of communication, communication is just not limited to the verbal communication, but it would also include non-verbal gestures as well. So it would be correct to say that, that just because I have seen a crime being committed, that does not mean that I am also going to imitate the same criminal act or an offense. Now what does it mean? It means that when we are trying to understand how this person is learning any behavior, we are focusing on the communication aspect. We as an individual are all a part of the social group that we live in. We may be associated with people who have been involved in criminal acts and over the period of time through the interaction with these people I may have also learned that what are the skills and techniques they might use in perpetrating this offense. I may also see what they are not only communicating to me but their gestures which constitute of non-verbal communication. So think of an example, now somebody is consuming a narcotic drug, now consumption of narcotic drug is regulated in any given society, let's say for, for an instance in India that having the possession of narcotic is an offense itself. Now this one person A is surrounded with three other friends who are abusing the narcotic drugs on a daily basis. 
Now, what he is also learning in this process, he is getting to learn that the chances of getting being caught are very less in this type of particular act. Secondly, that from where does one source this contraband? Thirdly, what are the risks associated with it? And the after effect when you consume the narcotic contraband. So how am I learning the skills and the technique and the responses to the criminal act? They are not only telling me verbally, but I am also observing their non-verbal gestures or their responses to this particular criminal act. So then he substantiated it is we learned in the process of interaction with each other. Now where this interaction takes place, as I said, we are all a part of social groups, we are social animal, we may move from our family group to friend circle or to the acquaintances at workplace and so on and so forth. Now, when we talk about the next proposition, he takes it forward and says that when one individual is learning any criminal behavior, he is learning it from his intimate personal groups. Now, what does this mean? Sometimes we see that crimes are being reported through various social platforms or media channels. Now, how does it influence you or me? Are we going to commit the same kind of offense? The answer is certainly no. So, we are not going to imitate any ad just because we have seen it through these impersonal mode of communication, which is, of course, the news channel, any other social media platform or let's say any radio channel. So what has been essentially argued in here that these medium or mode of communication have less influence over the mind of a person who is learning criminal behavior or any kind of other behavior. We can read the last part or the latter part of Proposition 3 which says, that it means that the impersonal agencies of communication such as picture shows and newspaper play a relatively unimportant part in the genesis of a criminal behavior. So just because I watch Southern India, I am not going to commit the same kind of offense. I am not going to imitate the same kind of behavior. Chances are more likely that if I'm seeing it happening within the social group that I am a part of, the chances are higher that at some point I may also give in. But then again, that does not decide whether you are going to get engaged in that kind of behavior 100% or you would refrain from that behavior because you have also seen what happens to them if they get Caught. Now let's move to the fourth proposition. He further says that when criminal behavior is learned, the learning includes the techniques of committing the crime, which are sometimes very complicated and sometimes are very simple. Secondly, the specific direction of motives, drives, rationalization and attitudes. Now, in this proposition, what he's trying to tell us is that, that when we are learning any criminal behavior, we are not only learning the techniques. For an instance, if a child goes to a store and he wants to shoplift something, he may have observed his friend doing the same thing in the past. Now, they will be careful that whether the shopkeeper is keeping an eye on the offender that we are referring to or he is busy elsewhere. He would be conscious of the fact that whether there is any CCTV camera that 
would capture him doing this criminal act so what i'm referring to here is that that the skills and the techniques that are required to commit the crime they are more readily learned through the people who are available in our immediate social groups now when we talk about this aspect not only we are learning social, these skills or techniques but we are also developing motives why should we do such types of acts and how do we justify these kinds of acts now this person who has been involved in shoplifting he may say that this shopkeeper is a rich man if i have shoplifted one article it's not going to cause any harm to the shopkeeper because he is a rich man so when he is learning how to pick any article he would be careful if someone is watching him or not he is also realizing this or developing this opinion or developing this attitude that it is okay for him to do so because anyway the shopkeeper is a rich fellow he is not going to cause him any harm immediately whatsoever so let's say he has done this for the first time he would be cautious when he is doing for the first time but the consequences that followed after this committing the particular act will certainly determine his attitude towards or his opinion towards this criminal act after having discussed the fourth proposition sutherland says that since we are a part of a social group within this social group there will always be competing ideas now what are these competing ideas let's say there is person a who never follows the speed limit as prescribed by the rules and regulation now why does he do so he believes that the speed limit is unnecessary he may believe that the roads are broad enough he may believe that driving at 70 km per hour whereas the limit within the city is 60 km per hour he believe that this is not going to do anything rather it could be the cause of traffic jam now this is how he is looking at it there may be another individual who believes that having the speed limit would ensure the safety of not only me but of other individuals as well so within the society we may have two different individuals person a and person b who may see the speed limit to be okay the second one not to be okay so whenever i am in bigger classroom i always ask my students some of you may believe that it is okay to skip one class because you know you have learnt it from your peers that if you skip one class it's not going to cost you anything the other student might feel that if he skips one class then the next following lectures will be difficult to understand so within one class room we may have two set of individuals having different ideas having different opinions now let's draw an analogy what sutherland is trying to say here he says in the context of speed limit example he says the person who believes that speed limit is for my safety or for the safety of others let's group them under the bracket of law abiding citizens they believe that the speed limit is there for a reason and the second group is someone who can be called as pro criminal because for him it is no big deal if he violates that regulation so let's group him under the second bracket that is criminals now when we talk about these different opinions or these different attitudes 
we are then going to classify them under two brackets. One is one individual who favors the violation of law and another individual who doesn't favor the violation of law. So when I'm referring to the opinions of these people, let's label these opinions as attitudes, right? Attitudes favoring the violation of law, attitudes not favoring the violation of law and accordingly we can say definition favorable to the violation of law, definitions unfavorable to the violation of law. Now within a social group or a society, we will always be coming across these two competing ideas for as long as people are going to exist and this leads to cultural conflict. So we can say it's a part and parcel of the society. Now this fifth proposition actually formulates the base of the differential association theory wherein Sutherland argues that an individual learns the criminal behavior through his association with others. He behaved differently, right? There is a deviance that is seen in him because he has learned that deviance through association with others living in this social group. Now, at what point this person will become a deviant person or will indulge in criminal behavior? And that is something which has been explained in the next proposition. And this proposition is also called as the proposition of differential association theory. So he then says uh, whether someone becomes an offender or not will depend on weighing the pro and anti-criminal offenses. So remember we had classified people into two groups, people abiding the law, people disobeying the law. Right? So, people obeying the law can fall under definition unfavorable to the violation of law. So, I am just going to write it here for your ease. Who are they? Who are these people? Are, the, are they law abiding citizens or they are criminals? Definitions unfavorable to the violation of law. So, they do not favor the violation of law. So, they are law abiding people. On the other hand, we have definitions favorable to the violation of law. So, who are they? We can say that these people are the pro-criminal. So, Sutherland argues that we are constantly exposed to both kind of people. Let's understand this again with the help of example. Remember that friend who was constantly exposed to three other friends who were abusing the narcotic contraband. He is exposed to these set of friends continuously on daily basis because he goes to college with them. He hangs out with them after the college hours. So, he is spending a lot of time with them. So, among these three friends, two of them will say that it is okay for you to also consume this because nobody is going to catch us. Whereas, the fourth friend or the third friend may say that it is not okay for you to consume it, but you may suit yourself. So, at a point where these definitions exceeds, what definitions? Definitions favoring the violation of law, that kind of association with your friend increases or exceeds against those definitions unfavorable to the violation of law, there is a chance, there is a likelihood that you are going to give in in the same kind of behavior. It is at that point that when an individual embraces delinquent behavior.
Now these associations with your friends can be a strong motivator for you or they may not be a strong motivator for you because your moral compass is very strong. You feel that let them do whatever they are doing. I am not going to do the act which has been called as an offense where I live. So it is that point where the criminality will flourish. Now I will take this example forward and talk about a child who has been born into a family where both the parents are drug addicts. And that's when the seventh proposition becomes very important. So when we look at these definitions which exceeds the definitions unfavorable to the violation of law, these definitions are influenced by four factors and they are frequency, duration, priority and intensity. So when we talk about frequency, what does it mean? How often this child has been exposed to the criminal behavior? We are talking about the child who is born to the parents who are drug addicts. When we talk about duration, for how long this child was exposed to this criminal behavior? Priority means at what stage of life, how early on in life he was exposed to this behavior which happens to be a criminal behavior. And intensity means from whom? Right? He was exposed to this behavior and in our example we said that he was born in a family where both the parents are drug addicts. So we see that he is constantly exposed to a behavior wherein both the parents are day and night abusing the drugs. He has lived with them for the longest period of time so the duration also defines whether he is going to give in in the similar type of behavior. When we talk about priority, he is exposed to this behavior at a very tender age of his life. And intensity, when we talk about influence, parents have some greater influence over the mind of this child. So these four criteria also defines whether the person will engage in the similar kind of behavior, it could be any behavior generally speaking and in this case it is a criminal behavior. So the relative impact would be decided keeping in mind these four criteria. Now after having understood this uh, proposition, uh, let's move on to the eighth one wherein Sutherland once again tries to oversimplify the Okay, now let's move on to the eighth proposition wherein Sutherland once again tries to oversimplify the process of learning the criminal behavior. He says, the process of learning criminal behavior by association with criminal and anti-criminal patterns involve all of the mechanisms that are involved in other learning. So what he's trying to do is trying to equate criminal behavior with any other normal behavior that one may learn. Now let's understand this with the help of an example. Imagine there is a person who has just learned how to steal a car and it is his first time. He will be very cautious when he is going to steal the car. He will, be care he will be careful if somebody is watching him or not. But over the time, let's say it is his 10th or 50th stealing, over the period of time he has honed those skills. Now, it will take him lesser time when he is going to steal the car. He will be more quick. He will be more swift and he will be more efficient and he will escape this spot. 
So when we talk about this aspect, when we do a particular thing for the first time, we may be a little hesitant, but as and when we keep practicing it over a long period of time, we may become seasoned in that particular behavior. So he is trying to tell us that it is as good as learning any other kind of normal behavior. Now, when I am talking about the other or flip side of it, it also suggests negatively, this means that learning of criminal behavior is not restricted to the process of imitation. So we may have referred to this aspect in one of the previous propositions as well that just because I have witnessed some crime to be committed, that does not mean that I am going to commit the same kind of offense. What we also learn how the investigating agencies respond to this act, how and when I have committed this particular act. Now, Coming to the last proposition of differential association theory, Sutherland says it's better to explain this with the help of example. Imagine that there is a thief who has stolen a few things and why he has stolen because he did not have any other means to sustain himself, right? And he wanted to make a living and his profession is nothing but stealing. On the other hand, we may see that there is an individual who is a hardworking professional. He also wants to make a living. So when we talk about that, what are the needs of both these individuals? On one hand, we have professional thief. On the other hand, we have a hardworking professional. So in both the example, the general needs are the same and those are that both of them want to make a living. But whether they are adopting the same means, whether they are adopting the same or following the same path, the answer is no. Let's understand this with the help of another example. A student plagiarizes the work. His goal is to secure the grade A. Now we have a very hardworking student sitting in the class. He also wants to secure grade A, but he puts in the hard work. So the need for both the student is to secure the grade A. So let's say that these needs are general needs. They may have general values also, but the path that these two individuals may choose could be different. So after having understood the example, Sutherland says, while criminal behavior is an expression of general needs and values, it is not explained by those general needs and values. Since non-criminal behavior is an expression of the same needs and values. So a criminal may have the same need, an innocent person may have the same need. But these general needs does not really define why the person has indulged into a behavior that is labeled as a criminal behavior. So after having understood all the nine propositions, Sutherland is trying to tell us that, that, when, we, that when we talk about how does one individual become an offender or a deviant, it is only through the process of learning. And where does this learning happen? This learning happens through the communication. And where does this communication takes place? The communication takes place within the interpersonal social group. The chances are higher there that you may also likely to indulge in the similar behavior. Now, one may argue that sometimes we come across news like that the person had followed the same modus operandi in committing the murder of a person, what he saw in the news or any particular movie. We have come across cases like those. 
So if we follow this example, then the theory of the Sutherland, that is the differential association theory, and in particular, proposition third, it fails. Because I have learned how to commit the murder, how to hide the evidences, not through the interaction in my social groups, but what I have seen it on the media or what I have read it in the newspaper. Now we must proceed with caution here. Sutherland is not saying that cases like these cannot exist. Of course they can, but he is trying to draw the attention to say that, that we first need to learn the processes. How does one learn a behavior which can be validly applied even to people coming from the lower strata of the society or a person who is coming from the affluent society who happens to be a white collar criminal. So what is the point that we must take away from this discussion is that that the processes will remain same, be it lower class criminality or white collar criminality. I hope that you have understood these nine propositions. And to conclude this, Sutherland again exercises a caution because I've just given an example that there may be a case where he has been, you know, born in a family where both the parents are drug addicts. But think of an example where the child has seen that what happened to my parents when they abuse the drug, I do not want to follow the same path, right? So he may decide that he will never consume anything that is going to disturb his senses in his life because he was exposed to that kind of behavior throughout his life. So we may come across cases like those also that an individual is continuously all the four factors of frequency, duration, priority, intensity, all of them exist. Still, a person do not give in the criminal behavior. Again, it is to be seen as exception that happens. Sutherland did not deny that. And in order to illustrate this, he has given three examples. Imagine that in an area where the delinquency rate is high, by delinquency we mean where the crime rate is high, there is a boy who is very sociable, sociable. he is gregarious, active and athletic and he is very likely to come in the contact with other boys in the neighborhood. And he learns the same delinquent behavior from them and then he becomes a gangster. Now look at this illustration. We are saying that a boy is a sociable boy, he is active, he is athletic. So he did not inherit those traits. He did not born with those attributes. Rather, he came into the contact with the boys from the neighborhood and there are chances that he may also become like them at some point. But then what needs to be understood here that it is his motive and it is his strong will that can stop him from becoming like others. In the second example, we may see in the same neighborhood, the psychopathic boy who is isolated, introvert and inert may remain at home. He does not like to socialize at all. And he is living in the same neighborhood where we have delinquents. He may not become acquainted with the other boys in the neighborhood and therefore he may not become delinquent. This is understandable. Why? Because he never came into the contact with the other delinquent boys. Lastly, there may be another situation. The first boy in the first example, sociable, athletic, aggressive boy may become a member of a scout troop and not become involved in the delinquent group. So we need to actually look at these two. Let's say we are talking about the same boy in the first set of circumstances. 
he was coming into the contact with the other delinquent boys in the second set of circumstances he decided not to and in the second set of circumstances the same boy decided not to become the member of that delinquent group rather he joined a scout troop and he was never involved in any kind of delinquent behavior so when we look at this this main point actually becomes the point of criticism of sutherland's differential association theory that the critics believe that sutherland has failed to argue what happens if someone has a strong will what happens if someone do not want to indulge in the same kind of behavior because he has rationalized that what are the bad consequences what are the repercussions of the criminal behavior so but in all sutherland had made an attempt to understand that it is the person's associations which determines whether he will become a criminal or not and this is to be understood in the context of the social organization which he called as social disorganization now after having understood how does one learn the criminal behavior his research scholar the scholar of edwin at sutherland named donald cressy was interested in knowing that when we look at white collar crime which entails the violation of position of trust and he then labels them as trust violators why do these trust violators commit an act which can be a criminal violation so when we talk about we have already discussed this that he is labeling those individuals as trust violators he is trying to make an attempt to understand that when these trust violators have violated the position of trust what are the justifications they give for the acts that they have done when i say justification what are the defenses that then they later on take that why did i do so right what was the motivation for me to do a particular act what actually drove me to do this particular act so it is very interesting to note that when the white collar criminals are been interviewed more often than not the answer is common and they say we did not think that we were doing anything wrong we were just trying to save our business just by changing the digits on the balance sheet we did not realize that we had caused any harm that is the common response that is found among all the white collar criminals who are trust violators so donald cressy had developed a hypothesis which later came to be known as the fraud triangle theory so he was basically studying the embezzlers that why do people who are working in businesses commit embezzlement so he was bringing their experiences into the literature so he was not the one who described this hypothesis as a fraud triangle but it was much later that what he had said or what he had discussed came to be known as a fraud triangle theory so let's first discuss the hypothesis it says trusted persons become trust violators when they conceive of themselves as having a financial problem which is non shareable please make a note of the highlighted part that is that they are facing some financial strain and they believe that this financial problem is non shareable simply saying they believe that they cannot share it with others also it is their perception that they are aware of the problem 
that can be secretly resolved by the violation of the position of financial trust. So in the previous session, we did discuss that in white collar crimes, principally two factors are important. That is duplicity of the position of power. And secondly, that when the trust is violated, it may result into misappropriation or tweaking the numbers in the balance sheets to keep the business afloat. We will discuss the example on this point. So the second aspect of this definition says that these trust violators are aware of this problem. Are aware this problem can be secretly resolved by violation of the position of financial trust. And then they are able to apply to their own conduct in that situation, verbalization which enable them to adjust their con conceptions of themselves as trusted person with, the, with their conceptions of themselves as user of the trusted funds or the property. Now, when we look at the three different limbs of this hypothesis, it can be categorized into three points as placed on this triangle. First one is the pressure, second one is the opportunity, and the third one is rationalization. So we are going to discuss each one of this step by step. When we talk about pressure, it is a financial problem that is faced by the trust violator. And it is him who believes that he cannot share this financial problem with others to alleviate the strain that he is facing. Now, when we talk about white collar criminals, we did discuss that they are the people of high respectability and social status. So for these white collar criminals, their social status is very, very important and dear to them. So what happens if they were asked to share this financial problem with others? They may fear that if they discuss this financial problem with others, they are going to lose the reputation that they were holding that they are going to lose the status that they were holding. So because of the fear of losing their reputation and status, they perceive that it is better to keep this financial problem as a secret. And they do not discuss it with others who can probably help them to alleviate the situation. Now, uh, Donald Cressy has uh, categorized these non-shareable problems into six categories. First one is violation of ascribed obligations. Now, when we talk about ascribed obligations, these people are holding the position of trust. So we have repose or delegated trust into them. So not only they want to be looked as someone who follows the ethical, but they also want it to be respected. So let's say because of some factor which was not in his control. For instance, COVID situation. We had seen the businesses had failed. And one such example was that a restaurant owner was holding the oxygen cylinder and then he was selling it at the higher profits. Now, when we talk about this problem, Winston Churchill had once said that never let a good crisis go to waste. So what you are doing, you are tapping on that opportunity and you are making the profits out of it. Now, when we talk about this person, he is obviously someone who enjoys some social status in the society. He was finding it difficult to keep his business afloat. Therefore, he had one opportunity wherein he can, where he could hold the cylinders, oxygen cylinder, and then sell it at exorbitant profit. So this was the problem for him that his business was facing a financial crisis. He believed that he could not share it with others. Therefore, he violated that position of trust, which is 
you know, reposed in him. Now, when we talk about this, historically noted that uh, inability to repay the debt becomes a strong motivator, right, for the white collar criminals to not share this problem with others. As I said, they want to keep it secret. They do not want to share it with others because if they do so, they are going to lose their reputation and status. So this can be one of the factors of having the pressure to not share the problems. Second one is problems resulting from personal failure. Now, in the first example, uh, the situation had arisen which was not under his control. But in the second uh, category, there are some bad decisions being made by this white collar criminal. He did the poor management of the assets and therefore he is now facing the losses in his business. So I have simplified it as financial problem resulting from misguided or poor decisions. But all the businessmen have this uh, eternal optimism where they believe that they will be able to, you know, uh, keep their business afloat. Things will get better if they take another loan for which they might even create or keep uh, fake collaterals. When we say fake collaterals, there's nothing that exists. It just exists on the paper. So what is happening in here that they do not know when to stop. So in order to safe one business because of poor management some loss has been caused he is taking another loan so he does not know when to stop third is business reversals so sometimes when we look at the market conditions there may be high inflation rates high interest rates and raising capitals and in this example this previous example can once again be used so when we are talking about business reversal it has nothing to do with personal failure but these are the market conditions that may keep changing from time to time and therefore there is a strain on the business now when we talk about what happens to these uh, trust violators when something like this uh, a financial strain is being experienced by them it is not that that they do not want to share this problem but there may be some instances where he did not have people to share this problem with so what happens here is that he goes into the isolation he does not share this problem with the others now fifth one is very very interesting which says status gaining now when we talk about white collar criminals they come from the acquisitive society wealthy classes from affluent society and they would like to continue their association with people from the same social group now let's say the business is going into losses if they were to admit this to their friends in their social circle, the chances are that he may be boycotted from that social circle. So this becomes another reason that he aspires to be having continued association with the social group of a certain level and this may prevent him from sharing the problem or the pressure that the business may be facing. Last one is the employer and the employee relation. Sometimes we say that employee has not been treated correctly. Maybe he is under, he, maybe he is underpaid. So he develops a resentment towards the employer. And when he has done something that is a pressure, he may take a revenge against the employer. So these are the six non-shareable problems. So in addition to these pressures, one needs to understand that what enables this trust violator to commit a fraud along with these strains which he thinks are not shareable, what comes along is the opportunity. Now for this opportunity, he needs to have two things going on. One, that he is somebody who has the general information, let's say access to the computers. He knows that if he violates this law, nothing is going to happen to him. 
right and he only has the technical skill to do that so when we talk about general information it is simply the knowledge that the employee's position of trust could be violated due to weak internal controls or ineffective governance system and technical expertise only this person has again the covid times is the good example on this point now the last part of it is rationalization that when these offenders are being asked what defenses do you have why did you do a particular thing the common responses it the common responses are that they thought these are non criminal acts they did not think that they were doing anything wrong as i said previously they thought that it was justified had they been put in the similar situation again they would do the same thing and they believed that the situation was such over which the offender had no control so when we talk about rationalization we are looking at the defenses which are being taken by these trust violators so with that we have uh, tried to at least make an attempt to understand why do trust violators commit fraud and what are the defenses that they take today we have talked about two things just summarizing that how does one learn a criminal behavior for that you will refer to the differential association theory and for the second part why do criminals do a particular act what are the motivations for them to violate the position of trust for that you may refer to the fraud triangle theory now this theory to date has been used in detecting the fraud thank you Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. We usually know William Shakespeare as the most revered figure in the history of English literature. But we often tend to forget that he has also been one of the most hated figures in literature. And here I'm not talking only about those boys and girls who have to memorize a long sections from Macbeth or King Lear or Julius Caesar uh, before they can go and sit for their school and or college exams. But I'm also talking about people who are themselves quite famous authors. Tolstoy, for instance, considered the writings of Shakespeare to be, and I quote, crude, immoral, vulgar, and senseless. George Bernard Shaw absolutely loathed Shakespeare, as he did Homer. But perhaps no other criticism about Shakespeare is more damaging than the one which says that Shakespeare is a marvelous storyteller, provided someone has told him the story earlier. Now, this piece of criticism is particularly damaging because it is true. None of Shakespeare's plays contain any original story whatsoever. They are all written using pre-existing materials, pre-existing stories. Now, does that diminish the stature of Shakespeare as a dramatist? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide. See you in the next episode of Literary Snippets. <laughs>